and welcome to this talk. So my name is Kate and I'm in the first year of my PhD at Newcastle University. Um, today I'm going to be telling you how we can use quantum fluids to model a phase transition in the early universe. But before I begin, I must of course acknowledge my supervisors, Ian Moss and Tom Billum, and also my collaborator, Andrew Grosschek. So since this is a cosmology talk, I'll first give an explanation of what a quantum fluid is. Now, if you're already familiar with this, of course, feel free to skip ahead. Um, I'll then go on to explain the notion of vacuum decay, explaining how we can use quantum fluids to model this phenomenon. Um, I'll then go on to validate our numerical model choice by presenting some equilibrium results before going on to model bubble growth. I'll finish with a brief summary of our future plans. So as promised, quantum fluids. When we talk about quantum fluids, we're usually referring to some relation of the Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, so consider a system of weakly interacting identical bosons. Um, confined to some sort of trapping potential, for example, a harmonic potential. Now, the first thing to note is that bosons are sociable particles. They're more than happy to occupy the same state as one another. Now, at high temperatures, we expect a lot of the modes of our system to be populated. However, as we cool below some critical temperature, we find that the bosons begin to rapidly accumulate in the ground state. But this is only half the picture. Um, so we also have to consider the wavelength associated to each of our bosons. Now at high temperatures, this wavelength is short, meaning that individual bosons are easily distinguished from one another. Um, however, as we cool, the matter wave of each boson begins, it gets longer and the waves begin to overlap. As we cool to extremely low temperatures, we find that we end up with um, wavelength so large that no individual particle can be distinguished. We end up with a collection of ground state atoms all described by one wave function and this is Bose-Einstein condensation. Now plotted here is um, the proportion of atoms in the ground state of our system as a function of temperature. So as we cool below our critical temperature we find that this proportion rapidly increases from zero um, initially, but as we continue to cool, um, its increase slows down, only reaching one at the idealized temperature of absolute zero. So if we're modeling um, an experiment taking place here, we're fairly safe to assume that all of the atoms in our system are in the ground state. Whereas if we're modeling an experiment over here, we really have to consider some of the higher energy modes. So it may be somewhat surprising that this extremely low temperature um, phase transition can actually be used to model a phase transition that is thought to have occurred at incredibly high energies, known as vacuum decay. So what is vacuum decay? Um, so if we consider a potential of this form, so yeah, here um, phi is a scalar field. So as you can see, this potential has two minima, one local minima on the right and one global minima on the left. Now, in a classical system, this local minimum here is a stable state. Um, if a system find itself, finds itself here, it'll remain here forever. However, once we enter the quantum realm, this is no longer stable. It's only metastable. So a system can stay here for quite some time but eventually a quantum fluctuation is going to give it a kick and cause um, cause our field to tunnel from this local minimum which we refer to as the false vacuum state to this global minimum which we refer to as the true vacuum state. Now you may have heard vacuum dis decay described um, as a means to the end of our universe. Um, however, it's of interest to me in the context of the early universe electroweak phase transition. 
Um, so this phase transition was thought to have occurred around one nanosecond after the Big Bang, um, when, the universe, uh, when the temperature of the universe was incredibly hot at around 10 to the 15 Kelvin. And this is thought to be attributed to the vacuum decay of the Higgs potential. So prior to this transition, um, the Higgs field was in its um, metastable false vacuum state. And at this time, photons and also the gauge bosons of the weak force were massless. And this rendered the electromagnetic and weak forces indistinguishable from one another. However, at the time of the electroweak phase transition, um, the Higgs field tunneled from its metastable false vacuum state to its stable true vacuum state. And this mechanism gave mass to the weak boson, uh, to the gauge bosons of the weak force, causing these two forces to differentiate from one another. Now, according to the standard model of particle physics, the electroweak phase transition was second order. However, some, mis well, I guess some interesting unsolved mysteries of our early universe could potentially be explained if we go beyond this and um, consider this to be a first order phase transition. So by this we mean that the universe was converted from the metastable false vacuum state to the stable true vacuum state via bubble growth. And this is maybe clearer if we look at this schematic here. So at some time, um, quantum tunneling caused small regions of true vacuum in yellow here to form. And these expanded outwards rapidly at the speed of light, eventually converting the whole universe from the false vacuum state to the true vacuum state. So how can we model this using quantum fluids? Well, for this, we need a cold atom system comprising of two different components, um, each with their own wave function. And as you'll soon see, it's convenient to write each wave function in terms of the particle density and phase of each component. Now, the particles in our, in, uh, in our system interact via a time independent interaction potential of this form. So here, G is the interaction strength um, and each species, like each of our two atomic components has the same interaction strength here. Mu is the chemical potential. These sigma terms are Pavli rotation matrices and I'll explain what lambda and epsilon are on the next slide. Um, now the most important thing to note here is that the first three terms are self-interaction terms which explain how each species, like particles of the same species interact. Whereas this final term here um, describes how particles of different components interact with one another. Now, when we substitute these density phase um, forms of our wave function into this static potential, um, the result is something that should hopefully be familiar. So with a bit of algebra, and some rescaling, the result of substituting these into our potential um, is this potential here. And this potential only depends on the phase difference between our two atomic components, which I will denote by the Greek letter phi. Um, so here I've plotted this potential as a function of the phase difference. And once again, we see this familiar shape. So we find that we have a metastable um, local minimum when the phase difference equals pi, whereas we have a stable global minimum when this phase difference equals zero. And we have this potential barrier in the middle. So the parameter lambda sets the height of this potential barrier, whereas the parameter epsilon is used to set the difference in energy between the stable and metastable states. So now we need to choose a numerical model. Since um, the process we're modeling is relying on fluctuations to kick a system from a metastable state into a stable state, 
we have to work in this region here um, where we have to consider multiple modes and not just the ground state. So we're interested in all of the low energy macro macroscopically occupied modes in our system. And we really need to take into account thermal effects. So we use a pair of coupled stochastic projected Gross-Potevsky equations. So this model, so sorry, yes, we've got one equation for each of our two different components. So we use a single wave function, psi, to describe all of the highly occupied, low energy coherent modes of our system. And we treat all of the higher energy modes as a thermal bath. Um, we have a parameter gamma in our equation, and this controls the rate at which atoms move in and out of our coherent region from the thermal cloud. Eta is a Gaussian noise term, which describes random fluctuations within our system. And this has correlations which are dependent on gamma and also temperature. Um, also, the noise of each of our two um, components is uncorrelated. Finally, we also have a projector, and this just ensures that our wave function psi um, only includes modes of sufficiently low energy. Now, in order to verify that this model is appropriate, um, we compare um, some results using this model with some known theoretical results for an equilibrium system. So we consider a one-dimensional homogeneous system with periodic boundaries. So what we do is we initiate our system in the stable true vacuum state and let it equilibrate over a range of temperatures. And for all of our equilibrium simulations, we fix the barrier height by setting lambda equals 1.4. Um, now the quantity that's of interest to us is the correlation function of the phase difference between our two species, uh, two atomic species, which is given by this formula here. Now, due to the stochastic nature of our equation of motion, these angular brackets denote not only spatial averaging, but also an average over 100 simulation runs. Now, according to Klein-Gordon theory, um, the, correlation, the spatial correlation function should decay exponentially um, with rate m, where m here is the mass of our stable state. And also note that this prefactor, sorry, um, depends on both temperature and this mass. So this plot here um, shows the decay of our spatial correlation function for a range of different temperatures um, from 0.01 to 0.07. Um, so the solid and dashed curves here are our theoretical curves from Klein-Gordon theory, whereas the various shape markers show the data points generated from our simulations. And these have been thinned just to make them look more clear. Um, so we see that we always have relatively good agreement between theory and data. Um, this is evidently better at lower temperatures. However, at all of our, um, the temperatures that we investigated, we still see the expected exponential decay. Um, we found better agreement if we removed the value of, like the mass value generated using lambda equals 1.4 and replaced it with a free variable A, um, which we fitted to our data. Um, the result is much better agreement between theory and data. So now that we've checked the validity um, of, our, of the stochastic gross projevsky equation, um, we're safe to proceed um, to consider some more interesting results. So here we consider um, the exact same system. However, this time we initialize our system in the metastable state and essentially wait for a fluctuation to occur that's strong enough to kick our system 
from the metastable false vacuum state into the stable true vacuum state. And we considered a slightly lower range of temperatures here. So this is probably clearer if we consider a plot. Um, so these plots here show the phase difference between our two components um, as a function of both position and time. And here we have three different simulation runs all at one temperature. Um, so as you can see, all of our simulations begin in this dark blue um, regime, which corresponds to the um, metastable phase. Oh, and sorry, I should say that here, we haven't actually plotted the phase difference itself. We've plotted the cosine of this quantity just to um, get around any issues with phase winding. So as I say here, we all be always begin in the false vacuum state. And after a variable length of time, we find that um, one grid point manages to find its way into the true vacuum state. And once this happens, we find that a bubble of true vacuum or a bubble of stable, I guess <laughs> a bubble of stableness, <laughs> expands out um, from this point, eventually converting our whole system from the metastable state into the true st um, the stable state. Um, so as you can see from this middle plot here, we sometimes have more than one bubble. So here we find that two bubbles are able to form and um, one slightly before the other. Um, it's more interesting, I guess we learn more from considering the trajectories of the spatial average of our phase difference over time. So this plot here shows 10 such trajectories. And we say, um, so a bubble, bubble growth is essentially characterized by this quantity, like a trajectory jumping from minus one to plus one quite suddenly. Um, so we can see here just from this small sample, which are all again um, from simulations at the same temperature. Um, even at one temperature, we, we see bubble growth occurring at quite a different range of times. And we can use these trajectories to calculate the survival probability of remaining in the metastable state. For this, we actually used a thousand simulation runs at each temperature. Now, again, because of our, the stochastic um, aspect of our equation, we find that we have some fluctuation about minus one before um, bubble growth occurs. So just to keep on the safe side, we only register that a bubble has formed once this, um, these trajectories reach, reach minus 0.8. Um, so the survival probability of remaining in the false vacuum is simply given by the proportion of our 1,000 um, trajectories for which this minus 0.8 threshold has not yet been met. So according to theory, um, our survival probability curves should decay exponentially with time. And this is what um, this example plot here shows. Um, so our data does indeed follow the expected trend. So the black curve here shows our data, whereas the green dotted line, which I guess isn't too clear, my apologies, um, this shows an exponential fit. And we see almost perfect agreement here, which is a good sign. Now, according to Instanton theory, the decay rate capital gamma of our probability, of our survival probability curves, should take on this form here, where A is a constant and B depends on epsilon, temperature, and also an additional parameter alpha. So this plot here on the left shows the value um, the relationship between capital gamma as a function of temperature for a variety of barrier heights. So we can see here that gamma increases with temperature, but gamma decreases with barrier height. Um, so these points here, are the, they were generated from our simulations, whether um, 
sorry, whereas the solid lines show the theoretical curves generated using a fitted value of alpha, sorry, using a fitted value of A, um, but take, but this takes, sorry. So these, theor these theoretical curves here use the values of alpha taken from this recent paper, but we fit the value of A. And we see relatively good agreement between theory and data here, particularly when the predicted values of capital gamma um, are lower. Um, this plot on the right shows the relationship between capital gamma and temperature for some lower barrier heights. And we see here that as we decrease lambda, um, the curves of capital gamma increase, uh, sorry, change from a convex shape to a concave shape. Um, now, these curves show better agreement between theory and data, but this is because we've now fitted both capital A and also alpha. So what are our plans for the future? Um, the first thing that we want to do is replace our static interaction potential with an oscillatory potential following the recent work, well not too recent, but following this work by Braden et al. Um, so they found that using such an oscillatory potential um, creates an instability in a system. And we want to find out if we can use our stochastic projected gross potevsky equation to damp out this instability. Um, looking further forward, our plan is to upgrade our simulations from a one-dimensional system to a two-dimensional system. And I'm sure that'll bring lots of complications with it. So that brings us to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening and well done if you made it to the end. Um, for a full list of references, check out um, our recent paper on archive given by this number here. So again, thank you very much. And that's the end.